it's a great pleasure introducing dr om ganda you know the we always were told by my guru dr reheja that this is one point contact in harvard medical school this is a one point contact if you want to go and learn in jocelyn clinic and dr om ganda was ever willing to give us some birth in jocelyn boston and harvard medical school this man has got some record number of papers he is involved in multiple landmark trials particularly dcct adac and multiple nih trials he's got more than 150 great publications in many journals you'll see om ganda's name multiple places he has written more than 35 chapters and books on diabetes and i have a great pleasure in introducing him and i'm sure i'm equally eager to hear him today amongst all of you over to you, dr om ganda thank you very much uh, dr boraskar can you hear me okay yeah okay i'm trying to share my screen and uh, here we go and let me put on my uh, slide show thank you for that very kind and very generous introduction dr boraskar um you yourself are an accomplished diabetologist in india and uh, i it's always a pleasure to meet you personally hopefully next time we can do that uh once this uh, tragic period subsides so i think you can all see my slides i'm going to uh, talk about just very briefly about the hmg coa inhibitors known as statins and then go on to talk about pc pcsk inhibition uh, how far we have come and where do we go next so in this limited time let me start off with my objectives first and uh, these are my disclosures uh, i don't think anything i'm talking today it has to do with uh, any of the, my uh, my uh, disclosures listed here so so briefly speaking uh, let me actually i think i may have got on the wrong slide set here so hold on one second give me one second here uh, i think i was just finalizing it last night so i do want to show you my final slide set which will take me one second to open uh, forgive me for that now i go back to it so oops this was the previous one uh, okay let me screen share again zoom share I apologize for this delay. It only take a second. I think I'm trying to find the final. So it said uh, it's asking me to register, which is not what I want to do. Resume share. Om, you'll have to stop screen share and then probably re-screen share. Ah. Okay, let me stop it and then go back share screen. Um, One second. Okay. Uh, let me close the previous set first. And this is the final set.
Okay, I'm screen sharing now, Sanjay, but I'm trying to find my slides here. No worries. Take your time. It's perfect. Uh, this is the brochure. No, just give me one second. I think I keep getting this screen. No, that's uh, the brochure. So you'll have to close that probably. Uh, Okay, there we go. Hmm. Sir, if I can suggest, you are such a great orator, you don't need any screen. <laughs> no, no, I do want to I do want to show some very interesting slide that I created just for this meeting and I try to be as up to date as possible. So let me see if I can somehow get back on the screen share. Give me just one second. The screen okay. share, let me stop share again. And let open me... your presentation first, so yes, sir. new screen share. So please open first. your presentation first and then first screen open share. Yeah. yeah, okay. Just open a presentation and then you can screen share it. Yeah, there you go. No, you're opening the scientific program. Uh, oh. oh yeah, sorry. So you have to remove that scientific. I think your yeah. presentation is below that. Yes. Yeah, right there. Right. Yeah, I thought I just opened it, but somehow I didn't. Yeah. Open. Uh, I think yeah. Now yeah. you got the presentation. I'll try to finish my talk. Two minutes. Uh, no worries. You can. Uh, you can. You're the last. You have the time, sir. We have, yeah, have the time. I don't want no to eat up on the. I don't want to eat up on the time for the panel. Can you see it now? Yes, yeah. we can. Yes. Sure. Wonderful. So again, my apologies, and again, once again, thank you, Dr. Baraskar, for your uh, wonderful uh, uh, remarks. These are my disclosures. So, learning objectives. Let's start with the roadmap here. Okay. So, I'll give you a brief recap of the HMGC reductase inhibitors, otherwise known as statins, and the LDL receptor. We'll then talk a little bit about the historical rationale for the PCSK9 inhibition. Why is it important? Impact of PCSK9 inhibitors on the revised targets for LDL cholesterol. This has played a big role in our new revised, more intensive targets in appropriate patients, of course. And finally, we'll end up on emerging lipid treatment options beyond PCSK9, uh, finally to actually come close to conquering atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So that's the agenda. And I know you had a talk on the uh, uh, guidelines for lipids. So I think I'll probably not be going much into that at all. So there won't be much overlap. I wish I could hear that talk earlier. But anyway, everyone knows that HMG-CoA uh, reductase is a rate limiting step in cholesterol synthesis. There are 27 different steps before you finally get cholesterol in place. And uh, uh, let me just hide this uh, button here, escape. So, so that's how cholesterol is formed. It's a very intricate process, very complicated process, but this is the rate limiting step. And uh, once the cholesterol is made, it uh, is carried in the body, what happened here. Uh, I don't know what happened there. Uh, so it's carried in the body uh, in this very beautiful molecule that is called LDL particle. Actually, it's a particle, not a molecule. But many uh, cholesterol uh, molecules are carried as terrified or free cholesterol, et cetera, et cetera. You know all that, that we have LDL as the main carrier of cholesterol. And the statins obviously have uh, indubitable evidence for the long-term efficacy and safety in uh, reducing cardiovascular events. So I, there's no point for me to go into any of those trials, uh, which are well known to you by now. So first of all, the question comes up, what is the optimal LDL cholesterol goal in patients with very high risk of cardiovascular events? And you heard about it in the guidelines, I'm sure, who's at very high risk, for example, people with the recent heart attack and multiple risk factors, people with recurrent heart attacks or strokes or peripheral arterial disease. So uh, this is where, where's the, uh, my summary 
of all these various guidelines for optimal LDL cholesterol. And right away, I just want to point out the fact that Endocrine Society just last year uh, came up with their latest guideline in distinguishing uh, from AHA, ACC, ADA guidelines, which say LDL should be less than 70, but you know, the, these guidelines are already three years old from the AHA and they didn't have all the studies that we have now. And NLA said the same thing, Canadian guidelines said the same thing, although they just revised it in 2021. So Endocrine Society says less than 55 should be the goal in people who are very high risk. And even before that, the European Society last year or two years ago said, if you have a second event in less than two years, you should be shooting for less than 40 because we now have evidence that lower is better. And in fact, less than 40 is better than less than 55 or less than 50. So this is how far we have come. And of course, in India, you have so much cardiovascular disease and so many people that are untreated. So we have to start somewhere, get to 70 before you think about going to 40 or 50. Non-HDL correspondingly less than 70. And if you do APOB, not necessary, but I, we do it at Jocelyn in people with high triglycerides. If you can get a reliable method, APOB is even more accurate than non-HDL cholesterol. Okay, so what do you do next? If you have um, somebody on as intensive therapy as you can, but it's still inadequate, you have less than 50% reduction or LDL remains above 70 then what do you do? The minimal goal is 70. Or you have somebody with statin intolerance, not complete intolerance, but they can only take low dose and that's not enough. So what do you do next? Well, we have a lot of options. This is from a review I published a couple of years ago uh, where I just listed all of them basically and brought it up to date. And what I want to point out is, is there are only two classes of drugs that are approved for reducing cholesterol and reducing cardiovascular events after statin. So use statin as much as you can in any dose you can, and then go to azitamide first. And if that's not enough, then the only other option is PCSK9 inhibitors that I'm going to talk about. There are two of them on the market since 2015, avolucamab and elirocumab. By now, you all know about it, at least uh, uh, may not have used it very much because of the cost issues we'll discuss, but these are the best drugs to lower LDL cholesterol. I'll then go on to talk about a few other uh, options. Now, one word on the azetamide trials. The only trial that showed that azetamide lowers cardiovascular events beyond statins is this huge trial called the Improve It Study, 18,000 people who presented with ACS, acute coronary syndrome, and they had LDL cholesterol at baseline. Actually, the goal was, um, you know, less than 70, but they were already below 70, as you will see in a second. They were randomized to simvastatin 40 or azitamide added to simvastatin, followed for a long time, almost five years. And the primary endpoint was the traditional endpoint. So look at this here. The baseline LDL cholesterol was already 70, 69.9. And then they brought it down to 54 or 53, about 20% reduction, as you might expect, with azitamide, and that led to a significant, uh, not huge, but 6%, but highly significant reduction in cardiovascular events. In fact, uh, people with diabetes did better. In fact, most of the benefit in this trial was in people with diabetes. And if you take out the non-diabetics, just look at the six or 7,000 people who had diabetes, they had most of the impact with azitamide. We still don't know the exact mechanism, but that's what happened. So that's the first line of drug after statin. Then the PCSK9 inhibitor. Very quick summary. What is the mechanism of action and how did they come about and when to use them? Well, it's a very interesting story. Um, you all know that, uh, start from the bottom, this is a liver cell shown here. If you use statins, you decrease the free cholesterol in the liver cell, or that can be done with very low uh, saturated fat diet. As soon as the cholesterol pool in the liver goes down, uh, the liver cell makes this very beautiful receptor called the LDL receptor. And that uh, kind of brings the blood uh, cholesterol from, from blood to the uh, liver cell or other cells in the body. And that's how the LDL receptor works. But for some reason, the mother nature decided 
we still don't know why, what's the teleological significance, that part of this LDL receptor is actually destroyed by this enzyme called PCSK9. It's a protease enzyme that causes proteolysis of the LDL receptor. So you don't get as much out of the LDL receptor as you should or as, as you could. So that was the rationale of thinking about how we can block the PCSK9 so that there's more LDL receptor available. Okay, not in people with homozygous hypercholesterolemia who have no receptor, but even heterozygous hypercholesterolemic people have one receptor. And that's where the story began. And this was really a serendipitous discovery. Only about 25 years ago or so, first uh, described by a French study, and then came this beautiful epidemiological study published in New England Journal 2006 uh, by Dr. Cohen et al. from Dallas. And they were looking at basically variations in these PCSK9, natural sequence variations. And they ended up with two sequence variations that were accompanied with low LDL, very low LDL, much lower than the general population. And they showed that these people were protected against coronary artery disease because they naturally had no PCSK9 to speak of, and therefore the LDL cholesterol was low in these people. So that started the story. Let me show you one slide from that particular study. So here they looked at presence or absence of these two nonsense mutations uh, shown here. Uh, 3,200 African-American subjects were included in this so-called ERIC study. 85 had this mutation, not very common, but uh, uh, some people did have this mutation. And their LDL cholesterol was 100 versus those without mutation who had LDL cholesterol of 138. You might say, well, 100 is not that low, but remember, this was their LDL from birth, not from age 40 or 50 when you start using statin. So that was the difference. And so people with no mutation among these 3,200 people, you can see there was a normal distribution of cholesterol, okay? This is the cholesterol curve. And people who had the mutation, you can see the whole curve is shifted to the left. And so therefore, they had much lower cholesterol compared to these people who had no mutation. And not only that, but since they were following these people for a long time, they found there was a 90% reduction in coronary artery disease events, huge reduction. Not normally feasible in our you know, hands because we start lowering cholesterol at age 40 or 50, as I said, but these are the cholesterol levels is birth. So anyway, this was the impetus to develop some uh, methodology to block the PCSK9 and to see what happens to people who don't have these mutations, but we can block this PCSK9. So there are two strategies to do that. One is you can make a monoclonal antibody to this PCSK9 enzyme. And this is exactly what has been done in the two drugs that we have right now on the market. So once you block the PCSK9 by this antibody, you no longer have inhibition of the LDL receptor. So you have much more LDL receptor available. The another smart strategy that is uh, now uh, going to become available uh, in the near future, already becoming available in some countries, is you basically stop the PCSK9 synthesis by this siRNA small molecule technology. And that's being done right now, and I'll show you an example. And that way, you don't even make the PCSK9, let alone blocking it later on. So these are the two methods to achieve our goal. Now, uh, speaking of the monoclonal antibody, as I mentioned, we have that available, two drugs, and both of them have gone through this major cardiovascular trial. Look at the number of people in the 4EA trial with avulacumab, 27,000 people, and another 19,000 in Odyssey trial with uh, elirocumab. And you can see huge reductions. These people had very high uh, cardiovascular disease to begin with. They were either with CV events or had very, very high risk, and most were on high or moderate intensive statin dose, whatever they could tolerate. And uh, you can see the baseline LDL was close to 80, and within weeks, it, were, it brought down to 30. So this is how important this reduction is, 60% reduction on top of statin, 30. And same thing happened with uh, alirocumab, starting a little bit higher, but again, 60% reduction going down to about 40 from about 118 or so. So these kinds of numbers were never seen before 
first time that we could see lowering of LDL cholesterol to that level. With that approach, this is what happened. Both of these studies were published earlier, as you know, a few years ago. And the uh, avulocumab trial showed um, over the course of about two and a half years, about 15% reduction in major MACE events, and actually 20% reduction in the three-point MACE event, not shown here. Exactly the same thing happened. It's amazing how exactly the same 0.85, 0.85, and same 20% reduction. Uh, unfortunately, these trials were stopped early, which may have been a mistake, but they didn't want to take any chances. You can see the curves are still diverging. So the actual reduction could have been higher had these studies gone longer. But the point is that both showed a highly significant reduction in LDL cholesterol and reduction in the events. Okay, what about key adverse events with these drugs? Uh, one question right away that comes up is, can you lower LDL cholesterol to 30 and even lower and not get any side effects in your brain, any neurocognitive function, for example? This was looked at extensively in this, uh, particularly the avulocumab trial. So here is, first of all, muscle-related events, which uh, sometimes uh, limit the use of statin. You can see there was no difference between the placebo group and avulocumab. So these drugs don't cause myalgia. Secondly, they don't cause diabetes, as far as we know. Just a slight increase here, but not significant, 8.1 versus 7.7. .7. Uh, we still need to follow people to make this point very, very definitively, but so far doesn't appear to have any diabetogenic effect, unlike statins. And finally, a huge battery of tests was carried out um, in this uh, avulocumab trial. You can see by all those tests, there was absolutely no difference in neurocognitive function. Again, I think this uh, uh, phenomena has to be studied over a longer period of time uh, because these are relatively short term for that purpose and mostly um, uh, looking at uh, various ages, not very old people. Okay, uh, one side uh, kind of uh, view here, there was an earlier study, in this case with avulocumab, again, showing that not only they reduce LDL cholesterol, but they actually reduce atheroma volume. So basically they cause regression of atherosclerotic plaque, seldom seen with other drugs. Uh, high intensity statin might do a little bit, but this is much more slow. 64% versus 37% of the people achieve some degree of reduction in the atheroma volume. So uh, very exciting data, uh, very much in uh, practice right now. We've been using it from the time these drugs became available. Of course, the main issue is, uh, you know, getting the insurance companies to pay for it. And I know that in countries like India, still very expensive, but as time goes on, hopefully uh, this uh, advantage of these drugs uh, in causing further uh, reduction in events will be taken care of by lowering the cost. One side light, once again, I want to show you because we published this from a meta-analysis uh, about two or three years ago, effect of these agents on uh, LP little a. Um, we don't often talk about LP little a, but it's an important genetic component. And you can see that in this uh, nine uh, different uh, randomized control trials uh, with diabetes and pre-existing cardiovascular disease, almost a thousand people, we saw a 30% reduction in LP little a level. Same thing happens with the other PCSK9 inhibitor, avulocumab. And of course, um, uh, whether you look at just avulocumab 150 or 75 going to 150 without statins, these are totally statin intolerant, still 36%, same reduction. I should have mentioned that these drugs, since there are monoclonal antibodies, they're given every two weeks, sometimes every four weeks, uh, but most of the time every two weeks by simple uh, disposable uh, pen, which we use. Okay, now the last approach in this PCSK9, very exciting again, is this novel siRNA approach that I mentioned, which actually blocks the synthesis of PCSK9. What is the advantage of that? The advantage is you're not making PCSK9 synthesis uh, due to this, uh, uh, this small molecule technology, uh, uh, there are several studies that have been carried out. I'll show you only one of them, uh, 1,500 people. This is an efficacy study, mean age 66, LDL was 105 on maximal tolerated statin, and they gave them in glycerin. 
Now, the advantage of this drug is it's very long acting drug. You start it, uh, use it uh, in the beginning, uh, two injections over three months, zero and 90 minutes, then you give it every six months. And this was done in this efficacy study. And you can see, just like the monoclonal antibody approach, this is one of the many studies that have shown the same result. This is Orion 10. You can see about 55% uh, or so reduction on top of maximal statin dose, similar to what we saw with the monoclonal antibody. And actually, just to show you here, the percent change in the PCSK9 level. PCSK9 itself went down by 80% or so. Now, having said that, I should mention that the long-term cardiovascular trial with this agent still in progress, okay? Uh, this will probably be completed uh, sometime by the end of next year. But while we're waiting for that, uh, just two days ago in England, uh, this drug was approved. And uh, big stories, I just couldn't help making a slide. Uh, revolutionary jab to stop heart attacks or miracle jab to stop heart attacks in these major newspapers in England. Uh, FDA is still looking at it. They have been looking at it for a while, uh, looking at it for a while, and hopefully they will approve it. But National Health Scheme in UK already has, and they project how many people already are at risk after high dose statin. So they're expecting a lot of people further as the, as the cost goes down. Okay, so in the remaining time, uh, I'm going to talk about beyond PCSK9. What are the novel and emerging options for further reducing LDL? If, uh, for example, you cannot use PCSK9, uh, is there a simpler approach like a pill rather than an injection every two weeks or even every six months? Some people just will shy away from any injection, no matter what. Of course, the um, the glycerin injection actually is not a single injection, it's a 30 minute infusion. So the staff has to be trained uh, to use that. So first drug, I'm going to say a few words about, in fact, the only drug I can go into detail is bempidoic acid because it's now available on the market. It's an oral ATP citrate lyase inhibitor, currently approved only for people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease because their cardiovascular trial is also still in progress. Um, so approved for secondary prevention or patients with FH who have very, very high LDL cholesterol, which we know cannot be uh, controlled with statin alone. Uh, PCSK9 is an option or bempidoic acid now is a second option. I'm still having problem getting it approved in people with severe statin intolerance. Hopefully that will change. Then there is this drug I'm not going to talk about. Very exciting drug. It's an angiopoietin-like uh, uh, three inhibitor. Uh, very interesting physiology, um, a topic for some another time. And they just published uh, several papers, one in New England Journal, one in Circulation. It's called Evinocumab. It's available on the market, but only currently approved for people with uh, refractory FH patients. So hopefully you will not see many of these patients but it was just approved a few months ago. So we have one more option. And uh, there are some thyromimetics. It's an old story that are still being developed. And the old thyromimetics were actually discontinued because they had a lot of thyroid-like, thyro, thy, thyroxine-like effects as side effects uh, because they were not selective against the THR uh, receptors, uh, thyroid hormone receptor. But this particular uh, progress now is taking place with the thyroid hormone beta receptor, which is more uh, specific for cholesterol reduction. And who knows, someday we might be talking about a CRISPR technology to totally extinguish uh, not only the cholesterol issue, but the potential loci for atherogenesis. There are so many different steps uh, through which, um, you know, cytokines and, uh, uh, and um, uh, you know, uh, uh, various uh, other uh, loci that one can talk about that lead to atherosclerosis, a topic for another time. So bempidoic acid, how does it work? Let's go back to our cholesterol synthesis that I showed you in my first slide. Okay, so this is again cholesterol synthesis going all the way down from citrate, HMGC with reductase working here with statin. And all you have to know is that bempidoic acid actually works two steps proximal, okay, upstream from the HMGCO reductase site. 
So this blocks the synthesis of uh, cholesterol right here before it becomes acetyl-CoA from citrate. Uh, for some strange reason, um, uh, this does not actually result in um, some of the side effect that we see with statins. Uh, but uh, it's a very interesting technology. In fact, there are, there are mutants again, like the PCSK9 mutants that have been described in ACLY, uh, which actually are associated with less cardiovascular disease. So very interesting indeed. Uh, so by lowering LDL, by lowering cholesterol, they also uh, turn on uh, LDL receptor synthesis and thereby leading to uh, LDL cholesterol reduction. Now, again, there are many trials. These are all efficacy trials at this point. And I'll show you just uh, four trials recently published uh, together, uh, again, shown here. Um, in two of these trials, um, people had persistent hypercholesterolemia despite maximally tolerated statin therapy, one pill a day. And you can see the LDL went down 16, 17% beyond statin induced reduction. Same thing with the second trial. Okay, and then there on the right, you can see there are two trials in people who are totally uh, in, uh, intolerant to statin. It's hard to find these people who are totally intolerant, but they found 600 people in these multi-site studies. And you can see they did even actually a little bit better, uh, maybe because the baseline LDL cholesterol was higher to begin with, 130 versus 104 here. So they went down by 24% in each case. So that's very interesting. So right away, you might ask the question, how about a simple pill like bempidoic acid? Why not combine it with azetamide, which works at a different site, right? That's a cholesterol absorption inhibitor. And that's exactly what was done. A uh, few side effects, very few, uh, we have to be vigilant of, particularly slight increase in uric acid, and their cardiovascular trial is uh, uh, likely to be finished uh, next year also, 2022. Um, so watch out for it. But again, even though the randomized control trial for cardiovascular risk reduction is still in progress, the FDA approved both this drug as well as combination with azetamide in the same pill. Nexlitol, the first drug, and Nexlit-Z, commercially known as. Uh, so this is a study when they added bempidoic acid to azetamide versus placebo. Okay, so people uh, either got azetamide on top of bempidoic acid or they got placebo. And very interesting, uh, already these people uh, were on bempidoic acid and adding azetamide made another 24% reduction in LDL cholesterol, another 30% reduction in HRCRP. So the efficacy is great. It's really nice, but we need longer term data. Uh, we still use it in occasional patients when PCSK9 inhibitor is not, um, not affordable. Uh, and I have several patients now that are using uh, the combination as well, uh, in some cases, just pempidoic acid. Okay, uh, so this is now the last question you might ask. Well, what about adding pempidoic acid to PCSK9 inhibitor? Why not? There are not many patients showing the efficacy of PCSK9 that I talked about, but there'll be people with FH, a very high LDL cholesterol, who still cannot be in the target range with the PCSK9 inhibitor alone. So why not we look at this combination, which has actually been done. Uh, phase two study so far, baseline LDL was 103 on top of avulocumab. And then they got this drug. You can see it just appeared uh, online and uh, there was a 28% reduction. Amazing, 28% reduction on top of PCSK9 inhibitor whereas those on placebo, of course, did not change. So overall, a 30% reduction. So, uh, I mean, there's no debate over the fact that we can achieve very low LDL cholesterol, get it down to 50 if we have to, and get it down well below 70 in many cases. Um, very few side effects. PCSK9 inhibitors are amazingly well tolerated, just uh, local side injections and bempidoic acid, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we have slight increase in liver enzymes and some increase in uric acid as the main side effect. You have to watch out for that, particularly in people with gout or very high uric acid level. So I will, uh, I will end on this last summary slide 
that actually was also published now last year, uh, where I guess talked about overall options for ASCVD risk reduction in statin-treated patients. What do you do on top of statin, people who are still at very high risk? So here they are. Once you get to that point, what can you add? I already mentioned these three, azetamide, PCSK9 inhibitors, um, antibodies, and inclicerin, as shown here. I did not talk about um, uh, icosapentethyl, which is a separate story in people with hypertrichidemia, reduce it trial, which I was fortunate to be a co-investigator. And so if you have a patient, don't forget that on top of all this, you still can use icosapentethyl if they have baseline triglyceride as shown here, and they have diabetes and uh, two other risk factors, or diabetes age 55 and one other risk factor. That is the current approval by the FDA. And finally, uh, bempidoic acid trial, just like the PCSK9 trial is currently in progress. So by next year or year after that, when we can meet uh, in person on site, hopefully you will invite me to bring you up to date on that particular update with both of these ongoing trials. Thank you very much.